another way of uh, measuring the magnetic field intensity is in terms of, in CGS we call it uh, R step and one R step one R step is equivalent to this is equivalent to around 79 this is 79.577 ampere turn per meter so that's in CGS and MKS and another way to solve or calculate the magnetic field intensity is through the force and the magnetic flux it's uh, somewhat similar with the electric field in electrostatic e if you remember our e in electrostatic is equal to the force divided by the charge so the unit here is newton per coulomb and this is an electrostatic in magnetic field we can also do that instead of Q, we will be using phi or this is uh, magnetic flux density, a uh, magnetic flux, and F is the force in Newton. So the unit here will be Newton per fiber. Okay. Then for uh, infinitely long straight line, and the, uh, you can memorize this formula or later on. I have an example that will derive this formula then what's the relationship between b and h so if you observe the first formulas if you remove mu here then you have h so it, this is just uh mu or the permeability is just equal to the ratio of b and h the magnetic flux density divided by its magnetic flux density now this formula take note that this formula is uh, a nonlinear formula or an equation it's this not uh, it's not the same as the ohm's law for example the ohm's law is a equals i times r this is a linear equation a formula this means that r here is our our slope of that linear line or line here mu here is not the slope of uh, this one because this is not a a straight line so what does it look like it looked like this one so these are these are examples of some curves we call them bh curves or magnetization curves for some ferromagnetic materials and uh, how, how did they arrive with this one so what they did is if you have here let's say i have here this is our b max and this is our h so what they did is they apply the if you take a, a, a specific core and material then they apply a current then when they apply a current there's a magnetic field intensity they measure each and also they measure the magnetic field flux density and so on so they did that one until such time that even if they they are increasing the current or the h the there's a maximum for uh, the magnetic field flux density it saturate at this part this is the saturation saturation region and when you say saturation saturation region even if you increase h our bm will still remain so from that point 
when it saturate what they need they decrease the current and what happens is also the H in decreases and also the B decreases but not in a linear form until it reaches this point. So even if our H now is 0, so if you observe our H now at this point is 0 but our B does not become 0, it does not came back to 0 but at it has still a magnetic field density here and this point we call this point we call it there's a still a, a residual we call it a residual magnetism uh, remaining in the core and this is what we call the retentivity this is the value of B when H is equal to 0. Then, uh, so the current here is also 0, but when they uh, still change the value of the current, they reverse the current, it, becomes, it became negative. Then what happens is the value for BM decreases while the value for H uh also decreases in the negative direction and until it reaches zero so here if we see if we can see here our our b is now zero but h is not equal to zero and this part of this curve this is what we call there is still a volley for h and that h we call that one we call that one that volume we call it uh, the coercive force coercive force it's the value for each and the property is called coercivity then if you continue decreasing the value of i until again it sat saturates at a certain period then this will be saturation period then if we reverse again the direction then what happens is it goes back again and this point again is another retentivity or residual magnetism in the reverse direction then again this one is also a coercive force it's the other way around it's just negative and positive then it will go back again at that one. So it creates a loop. So when we reverse the current, then we do it again. Then we repeat the process from here again. Then you go back again and so on. So that will be repeated when the current is alternating from positive and negative direction. So this means that we can produce this certain loop if we apply a alternating current to a ferromagnetic material it's not possible to have this loop if you have uh, just a dc current because it, it's only at the dc uh, positive direction it only saturate at a certain part it will not reverse its direction so the magnetism will remain at the maximum uh, magnetic flux density even if you increase Magnetic, magnetic flux and uh, magnetic field intensity so this loop we call this one this is a very important concept we call this one the hysteresis loop so these are all loops and all loops differ it depends on uh, the material or the ferromagnetic material that being described so if we look at some of the curves for different ferromagnetic materials they have different uh, shapes so 
then what is the significance of this hysteresis too? The significance is uh, there's what we call a power loss due to this hysteresis. And that power loss is represented by the area covered by that loop. So this area here represents the power lost on the core due to hysteresis. This means that the power lost at the core is proportional to the area covered by that loop. So th this also means that the better, uh, the, the lesser the area, covered area, the better the core. So if we look at all these types of core, cobalt steel is the worst of them and the best is uh, the per 78 per malay core or the next is the silicon iron then the cast steel but the permalloy uh, permalloy is much uh, costly compared to the other types of course so nowadays we can use cast steel but mostly we can also use silicon iron it depends on the application now this area represents the power loss due to hysteresis and there's a formula for that. Uh, this was discovered by, uh, derived and discovered by experimentally by S Professor Steinmetz. And this is the formula. Uh, here we have K. K is a constant. This, this constant it depends on the type of uh, ferromagnetic material. So for for example, for um, a good annealed steel, for annealed steel, the value for K is actually equal to 0 0.0012. Uh, 0, 0 so this is a constant. 0 0.0012. 1, 2. For an annealed iron, annealed iron, the value is 0 point, 0 point 0, 0, 0.001. K is 0 point 0, 0, 0.001. Then for a silicon, for a good silicon steel, silicon steel. So this ranges from from zero point zero zero eight zero eight up to zero point zero 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 six. Uh, that one. So the best value for a silicon steel is 0 0.006 and the worst is 0 0.0008 so this one depends on the type of core and the f here in the formula this is frequency why do we have frequency here we have frequency because if you remember we can only have a hysteresis loop if we apply a alternating current here at our curve or at the the core so if you apply alternating current we produces a hysteresis loop so that's only possible if we have an alternating current so if we have an alternating current then there's a frequency and the unit for frequency is actually hertz per cycle per second so that's the frequency and the v here is the volume volume of the core in cubic centimeter depends on the shape of the core then we have b max raised to 1.6 this is the maximum maximum magnetic field magnetic 
flux density. And the unit for this one will be in NCGS Maxwell per cubic centimeter. Oh, no, it's square centimeter. It should be square centimeter. This is max. It means that uh, this is the value of B when we are in saturation region. When we saturate, even if we increase the value of H, then... Uh, the value of that B that does not change or goes down. Uh, then, there's a 10 raised to 7 here. So, that's the power loss. And the unit for this power loss will be in terms of watts. Then, another loss at the core is uh, there's a what we call eddy current loss because of the flux that's flowing through our uh, core, this eddy current loss, these are the, the losses that is dissipated in the core that turns into uh, heat energy. So when the core heats up, then that power that used to heat up that core is due to eddy currents. And we can also uh, solve this one through this formula. And uh, this one, we can minimize eddy currents by laminating our, our core. So just like in transformers, if you look at the transformers, they are, it's not a solid core. It's not a solid material. They are, they are laminated. There are many sheets that are lam laminated and compressed to each other. And... That's one way to oh, reduce the eddy currents in the core. Uh, so here in the formula, the eddy current power loss, we have K. This K, it's, uh, it depends on, also it depends on the, the volume or the, the type of ferromagnetic materials and also uh, the variation of flux, the arrangement of the core and the units that are used in the different uh, parameters then V here is the same as the volume in the first one so this is also in cubic centimeter T here this is a new variable this is the thickness thickness of lamination Lami Nation. So if you draw this one, if you have a core, so for example, this is our core. If this is our core, this is solid but uh, a laminated one, they are laminated here. It's like a transformer. So that thickness of lamination. Also, is one of the factors that uh, affects the eddy currents. So the the smaller the thickness, the thinner the the sheets that is used, then the lower the eddy current loss, and that is in centimeter. F here is the frequency in hertz, and still this one is the maximum uh, magnetic flux density in Maxwell per uh, cube uh, per square centimeter and the unit for this one will be watts so that's the uh, eddy current loss then permeability so uh, uh, I've already discussed this one permeability in the formula we always saw mu mu is means this is permeability but what is permeability permeability this is uh, the characteristic or property of a ferromagnetic material to oppose magnetic flux. So, oppose or, no, it, it's, it's not opposed but to allow magnetic flux. So, this is synonymous or analogous with an electrical circuit. This is analogous with conductivity. 
So, conductivity is the property of material that allows or to conduct uh, electricity. While permeability, this is the property of material that allows the magnetic flux in a magnetic circuit. So, they are uh, related, and they're analogous, and the unit for this one, the unit for mu is uh, actually per Henry or Henry inverse H. Ah, oh, no, no, no. The unit for this one is the same as the unit for the magnetic, ah, uh, the, the mu zero. Mu na, the, the air, the air permeability, which is equal to 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. Well, mu r here, this is what we call the relative, relative permeability. And this is unitless. Because mu r is the ratio of mu divided by mu na. They have the same uh, unit. And that's Henry unit. Another unit for this one. You can use Henry per meter as a unit for that one. Then... Here, we also have reluctance here. What is reluctance? Reluctance, if you look at the formula, you can uh, observe or deduct the analogy between the electrical circuit. This is VL. It's similar with, if you look at this one, over area. So what is this? This is resistance. This is analogous to resistance in electrical circuit the uh, analogous to resistance rho L over E so this one is the reluctance so resistance is the, the property of material that opposes the the electricity or the current well reluctance is also similar to resistance it's the property of a ferromagnetic material that opposes uh, the magnetic flux and it's also equal to this formula, uh, V L over E. So the unit for this one will be Henry inverse or or per Henry or per H. Then there's a V here. It's that is uh, similar also to resistivity. And that one, we call that one reluctivity. And that reluctivity is actually the inverse of permeability, which is also in in cir electrical circuit, rho is also the inverse of conductivity. Where conductivity here in magnetic circuits, it's our permeability. So therefore, reluctivity is also the inverse of permeability. So this will be in meter per Henry if uh, permeability is Henry per meter. So if we insert this one in this formula, the reluctance is equal to L all over mu naught mu r times the area. The area here is the cross-sectional area of the core or the ferromagnetic material. And length is the L here is this is the mean link mean length of the magnetic path so what does this mean so for example if this is the material so if, let's assume this is a circular uh, core it's a torus so what will be the the mean length of this one the mean length will be actually this one from here to here you don't use the outer circumference or the inner circumference but take the mean or the average between uh, the outer and the inner circumferences 
So you need to know the mean radius to solve for the mean length for this example. And the cross sectional area will be this well, this area. Okay. Next, um, we also have the inverse of reluctance. Or this is uh, similar with conductance. And this will be equal to this one. It's what this one over reluctance. Then I summarize this one. I summarize all the magnetic circuit equip, uh, components and draw the analogy between magnetic and electric circuits. So here, the equivalent of MMF is EMF in electric circuit. So the unit here is ampere turn or this ampere in EMF or in volts. In magnetic field intensity H. Uh, so this one will be ampere turn per meter. It's like volt per meter in electric field intensity or Newton per river or Newton per column coulomb in electric field intensity. The magnetic flux is analogous with electric current. Reluctance for resistance, permeance for conductance, relativity for resistivity, permeability for conductivity, and magnetic flux density for current density. Then, uh, this is the Ohm's law. Ohm's law of magnetic circuit. They call it Hopkinson or Rowland's law. The uh, arrived with this one. This both both of them arrived with this formula. This is analogous with electrical circuit, which is E equals I times R, where I is the analogy of phi, R is the analogy of reluctance, and MMF is the analogy of EMF. So this is on also applicable in magnetic magnetic circuits. This is an example of a magnetic circuit. So here, at this part, uh, there's a MMF that push this phi or magnetic flux in that direction. And this one, this MMF depends on I and N because MMF is just N times I. The greater the number of turns, the greater the MMF. If the greater the, uh, the, the, greater the MMF, the, the higher also the magnetic flux or flux. So how about the series reluctance? How do we solve for the series reluctance? So in here, the total reluctance is actually also similar with electrical circuits. This is reluctance 1 plus reluctance 2 plus reluctance 3 plus reluctance Four. And also, phi total, the total flux that is in uh, the magnetic circuit is the same as flux 1, flux 2, flux 3, and flux 4. So if we solve that one, flux total because MMF is equal to flux total times the total reluctance plus R2 plus RT plus R4. So that's Ohm's law. Then in parallel, it's also the same as in uh, electrical circuit the total reluctance at uh, this point will be also equal to 1 over 1 over reluctance 1 plus 1 over reluctance 2 plus 1 over reluctance 3 plus 1 over reluctance 4 and so on Then what happens if we have an air gap of if we cut the core uh, with the thickness T? So if we cut that core, then 
the formula is still the same because the magnetic flux or magnetic flux here is the same magnetic flux as in the core uh, assuming there's no magnetic flux fringing so what happens if T is large enough then there, there will be what we call a fringing flux these are leakage we don't want this these are fringing flux this only happens when T is greater or, or is much greater compared to the total length. So in general, we we in we disregard that one. We assume that the flux in the air is the same as the flux in the core. So if that is true, then we can apply this formula. Uh, the same formula as it's in series, the reluctance of the core is in series with the reluctance of the air gap. Then if you want to solve for the uh, MMF of the air gap, then it's equal to this one, where T is the thickness of the air gap. Mio is the air space permeability. Then the energy stored in a magnetic circuit is this formula. Uh, uh, it's a uh, long derivation, so it's somewhat similar with our formula before. Formula for power, power is equal to I squared R. You multiply it by one half, then it's the energy. It's the same as, or it's a similar with the inductor and capacitors. Here, the second formula, the area here is the area of the core. The length here is the mean length. B is the magnetic flux density. Mu here is the relative, or the permeability of the core. Now, let's take an example here this is a magnetic uh, a magnetic core in the form of a closed circular ring has a mean length of 30 centimeter and a cross-sectional area of one square centimeter the relative permeability of iron is 2400 what direct current will be needed in the coil of 2000 turns uniformly won around the ring to create the flux of 0 0.2 milli Weber then there's another question here what happens if we cut that core with a air gap of one millimeter so let's solve first for the the first question so the solution for the first question so we have here a ring an iron ring so this is our core then we have a coil here then we need to apply current i and that's what we want then because there's an i there's a turn so there's an uh, mmf at this point then there's a flux that's in this direction goes back so this one will be the length mean length which is equal to 30 centimeter we need to convert this one in meters so this will be equal to 0 0.3 meters then we have an area cross sectional area here and this is the cross sectional area which is equal to one square centimeter and we need to convert again this one into uh, meter square meter so this will be equal to 0 0.0001 square meter then uh, what else 30 centimeter then the flux that's in ah the area is wrong you should be 0 0.001 then the flux that's flowing here, T is equal to 0 0.2 times 10 to the negative 3 Weber. Then what we want to solve is I. So how do we solve for I? We use the formula for the MMF. MMF is equal to N times I. This is in MKS because I convert all them in 
and ks and this is equal to what we use ohm's law and it's equal to the flux flowing times the reluctance so here we know flux we know the number of turns but we don't know the reluctance how do we solve for the reluctance we use for the formula for reluctance before so the reluctance is equal to this formula L over mu O mu R over area. So Ni will be equal to phi times the reluctance L over mu O mu R times the area. And we want to solve for I. I will be equal to phi times L divided by mu O mu R a times n so this is the, the current that we need to produce phi so if we substitute all the values now we can solve for i i is equal to what is our phi 0 0.2 times 10 to the negative 3 multiply it with the length which is 0 points uh that's 0 0.3 meters all over mu naught 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 times mu r given 2400 times the area which is 0 0.0001 and the number of turns which is 2000 turns and if we calculate this one the current will be equal to 99.47 milliamps so this is the current needed to produce a 0.2 milliweber in this quark. The next question is what happens if we apply or we cut the quark? So if we draw it again, we cut this one. So the core now is cut and this one is t then this length will be the mean length of the core then again we have here a coil then we need to apply a current i then again we have flux here it's the same flux as the flux in the core so the flux and the air gap is the same as the flux in the core assuming there's no fringing on the air gap and that's equal to 2 milli a point 2 milli weber so now if you want to solve for the current to maintain that uh, phi the mmf now will be equal to P because it's constant it's the same the reluctance of the core plus the reluctance of the air gap so what's the reluctance of the core mmf is n times i we need to solve i p times the reluctance of the core lc over mu o mu r a c area of the core that's uh, t the thickness, that's the length of the air gap, the thickness T divided by mu O times the area of the gap. Now, so from here, we can see that the area of the gap is the same as the area of the core because there's no fringing and this is also, uh, we can just let it equal to A. And you can also say that the total length, mean length, is equal to the sum. T, the thickness plus LC. We can approximate this one. We can equate L with LC because thickness is very, very small. So there's a very small effect on the total length. But to follow the rules, we then we just use this one. Uh, we can remove this one. We can equate them di directly. Or we can equate the same R reluctance on the first one here. The 
and the reluctance here because t here is very very small because we want we assume that there's no fringing flux so if there's no fringing flux then t is really very very small but we solve it in general to show uh, to you how to do it if there's a t then so draw this one lc so from here we can solve for lc lc is actually equal to l minus t so these are given l and t we know the tot uh, total mean length and we know the thickness so n times i will be equal to so we can add them now this is mu o mu r take take the uh, lcd then he multiply it here so this will be lc plus this one divided by this one times this one so mu and a will cancel out so it will be mu r times t then we have we know lc is equal to this one so p Applied by L minus T plus mu R times T divided by mu naught mu R times A. We can factor out T here, so this will become L plus uh, mu R minus 1 times T. So if we compare again. Just like what I said, mu r is so much bigger than 1. So, it's just a small uh, frequency. If we approximate that one, then if we want to solve for i, i now will be equal to that one divided by n. p divided by n times l plus mu r minus 1 times t divided by mu o mu r times the area. So this is the formula for the current. If we have an air gap, which is equal to T. Then if we want to continue to solve for mi I, this will be equal to our P is 0 0.2 times 10 to the negative 3. And divide it with N, which is 2,000 turns. Then you multiply it with L, 0 0.3 plus 2,400 minus 1 times the thickness the thickness is 0 point uh, it's 1 millimeter or that is in, in meter 0 point 0 0 1 and divide this one with 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 multiply it with 2400 times the area which is 0 point 0 0 0 1 and if you plug in this one and solve for i, i will be equal to approximately equal to 8,894.9 milliamps. So if we have an air gap and if you want to maintain the flux we need to increase uh, the current in our coil okay then another example here we have another example. This is the derivation of the infinitely long straight wire. Using, uh, so we can use Mio support and Ampere's law. So I plotted the, the wire at the Z axis. So this is our wire. This is the conductor here. The conductor or the wire. Then our current is in that direction so the direction of dl vector will be in that direction and i want to determine the magnetic 
field density at this point. This point. So, to do that, we can apply first Gusebart law. So, Gusebart law says that in our formula, Gusebart law says that dB dB is actually equal to mu times I the vector EL and cross it with the unit vector or AR divided with 4 pi and the magnitude of that vector R here so here this is our R so the unit our unit vector now will be somewhere here this is our a r here so what will be a r or what's vector r if you want to solve for r here let's go back to the drawing r will be equal to what because it's going downward and in the z z so if it's going downward the z axis then it's a negative e z with the magnitude of z so it's negative z a z that's the z component and it has no x component it does not go here at the y com I x component here and here but it goes here with the distance r in the y positive y direction so this will be plus r a y so that's vector r so if you want to solve for the magnitude of r that will be equal to the square root of z squared plus r squared and if you want so to solve for ar so this is the magnitude ar will be you just divide this two so if you yeah, put it here this will be equal to mu times the current dl then crossed it with AR. AR will be equal to R over the magnitude R. So what's R? R is equal to this one. So cross this one with negative Z A Z plus R A Y and you divide it with the square root of this one. But it's the same as this one. So this will be 4 pi uh, z squared plus r squared so 2 plus 1 up so this will be 3 over 2 it's similar with in uh, similar as what we did in e126 then you take the cross product but what is dl vector dl it's also the same as in uh, e126 dl will be equal to what it's just uh, z axis so what will be dl so it's just equal to dz but what's the direction it's dz it's a differential length but the direction is upward direction so if it's upward then it should be positive a z so that's vector dl and we need to cross this one with this one so next so we can factor out uh, the different parts and or first we can integrate to solve this b now we integrate this one from because this is a uh, infinitely long straight bar then we can integrate it from uh, negative infinity to positive infinity because it's infinitely long times uh, all the uh, constant you can put the constant here mu times i times what else we have four pi these are the constant then what it means inside we have dz az so dz az crossed 
negative z a z plus r a y and this all over z squared plus r squared raised to 3 over 2 then next so what's next we can now solve for uh, we can cross this one now so how do we cross this one we, we don't need to use matrix we can just manually distribute this one because it's just easy easy cross negative easy what's the answer so if you draw again draw let's draw the x y z so this is a z this is a x and this is a y so a x cross a y is actually equal to a z remember the screwdriver but here it's a z cross negative negative easy so it's the angle between them the angle between them is 180 degrees so if we cross them the answer will be what cross product cross product uh, vector a cross vector b this is the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times sine of theta a n where theta is the angle between them so here the angle between them is 180 so what is sine of 180 what is sine of 180 sine of 180 is actually uh, 0 so a az cross negative az is 0 so that will be 0 so the next thing to do is to cross this one az and ay so what is az cross ay so what is az cross ay or is az positive az in that direction ay is in that direction so this is that if we cross it what will be the answer it should be equal to negative a x where's negative a x this is positive a x this is negative a x so it's in that direction it's negative a x so you can now put it here you can factor out the constant at the outside then the integral of so there's no easy component anymore so we just dz times r so r times dz then divide this one with z squared plus r squared raised to 3 over 2 and the direction is actually negative a x from positive negative infinity to positive infinity then we can now integrate this one or we can because r is constant we can also take out that one and the direction so what is the integral of dz over z squared plus r squared raised to 3 over 2 so remember we are integrating with respect to z r is constant here so what will happen so we can apply try to solve we can let z be equal to so if we draw the triangle this is theta this is the square root of uh, z squared plus r squared and this will be uh, z and this will be r so z will be equal to r tangent of theta this is from towa tangent of theta is equal to z over r so dz will be equal to r 
second squared theta d theta. Then the square root of r squared plus z squared is equal to the square root of r squared plus r squared tangent squared theta. So z is equal to r tangent to square that one. Then we can factor out r squared. Then this will be 1 plus uh, tangent squared theta. Then identity, what is 1 plus tangent squared theta? It's second squared. So the square root of r squared second squared theta. Or this is just equal to r second theta. Then if we substitute now this one, so we can now solve for the integ integral. This is r second squared theta d theta all over uh, the square root. This is raised to 3. This is the same as the square root of z squared plus r squared. Then you raise this 1 to 3. So this one is r second theta. Then we just square, uh, cube this one. Because the square root of z squared plus r squared is equal to r second theta. Then we can cancel second squared. So this one will be second. Cancel r and this will be r squared. So what remains here will be the integral of d theta all over r squared times second theta. But what is second theta? Second theta identity is equal to cosine theta. So this will be 1 over r squared, the integral of cosine theta d theta. So we can now integrate this one. What's the integral of cosine theta? It's actually positive sine theta. Then what is sine theta? Sine theta is so. So this will be 1 over r squared. So let's go back to triangle. Opposite over hypotenuse. So this will be equal to opposite z divided by the hypotenuse the square root of z squared plus r squared so this is the integral of that one so we need to insert this one here we have r at the top we multiply it with 1 over r squared so we have another r at the bottom so the integral now b now will be equal to mu i all over r over r squared or that is simply 4 pi r then times z over the square root of z squared plus r squared and this is from negative infinity to positive infinity in the negative ax direction and I just put the negative at the first part so this will be negative ax. Then upper limit minus lower limit. So this will be equal to negative mu i all over 4 pi r times the limit of z over square root of z squared plus r squared as z approaches a uh, positive infinity then minus the lower limit minus the limit of z all over the square root of z squared plus r squared as z approaches plus negative infinity then if we solve that one what's the limit of z as it approaches uh, positive infinity so this will be positive 1 this will be negative 1. So B now will be equal to negative mu i over 4 pi r times 1 minus negative 1. Or this is positive 2. So if you multiply that 1, uh, the b now will be equal to e divided by 2. So the final answer now will be negative mu i over 2 
by r in the x direction. So if you take the magnitude, it's the magnitude, if you want the magnitude of the magnetic field density and it's equal to mu times i over 2 pi r where r is the distance of the point that you want to solve to the conductor so we derive the formula for the magnetic field density you can also this do do this one instead of using rectangular coordinate system you can use uh, cylindrical coordinate system here it's better to use cylindrical because the, the direction here will be the direction of actually that's the direction of theta a theta b the direction of b is the direction of a theta it's counter clockwise and it's positive but if you look at here so the direction here will be in that direction and actually it's correct because this is x direction here is x here is negative x. So this part, this is negative x. So that direction is actually at the negative ax direction at this point because it's rotating. If you are at this point, then the direction will be in that direction in the y direction. But we take this point. So you can determine at every point. But the magnitude is the same. The only difference is the direction. So we derive this one. Okay. Uh, I have more many examples here before we go to uh, the part two. Part two of chapter four. We will take more example in the next video before we go to uh, magnetically coupled circuits. Okay.